In I Don't Want to Be the Strong Female Lead, a New York Times op-ed from February, actress-filmmaker Britt Marling analyzes and discusses the role of women in pop culture. Marling states that, aside from a handful of exceptions, there are an overwhelming number of dramatic narratives that murdered their female characters, including several prominent examples such as Chinatown, Blade Runner 2049, and Thelma and Louise. What does this say about us and the people who write these stories? Marling says these stories are a direct reflection of our world. Close to four women a day are murdered in America at the hands of their partners or former partners. One out of every four women in America has been the victim of rape. And Marling believes it is a challenge for writers to imagine a world in which such free women can exist without brutal consequences. So, Marling introduces the strong female lead, but even this role has many flaws. Marling explains that the strong female lead is influenced by masculinity and masculine traits, which translates to the audience wanting a man, but in the body of a woman we still want to see naked. Although TV and movies are a part of our daily lives, this topic is not something people regularly talk about, so it is a shocking and brutal realization. But I believe Marling's concerns about the strong female lead are the truth, because as someone who often watches seven movies a week, it makes me think more critically about the stories and storytellers I support. Over the past few years, Marling has written and starred in the Netflix original show, The OA, where her character, Prairie, breaks the standards of the strong female lead. Personally, I think The OA is an incredible show and a breath of fresh air to see stories told about women in this way. So, as I've been thinking about lately, how can we, and I, as a straight white male in the film industry, help restore the balance among people of all genders, races, religions, and sexual orientations? I watched the OA a few years ago, but more recently, I watched the 2017 film Lady Bird, written and directed by Greta Gerwig. It takes place in 2002 in Sacramento and tells the story of Christine Lady Bird McPherson as she navigates her last year of high school first two boyfriends, participation in the school play, and most importantly, applying for college. In the first shot of the film, we see Lady Bird and her mother Marion sharing a bed in a hotel room. As the morning sun peeks through their window, they are fast asleep and curled up face to face. What we assume is a perfect mother-daughter relationship quickly turns into fighting. They leave the hotel and hit the beautiful back roads of California, listening to John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath on cassette tape. When it is finished, Lady Bird and Marion share a moment of crying and laughing. Lady Bird reaches over to the radio to put some music on, but Marion objects, saying that they should just sit with what they heard and that they do not need to be constantly entertaining themselves. This frustrates Lady Bird, and they stare out the car window looking at the brown and green expanse of fields surrounding the highway. After that brief moment of peace and quiet, Lady Bird explains to her mother that she is unhappy with her life and that it is not exciting. They get into an argument where Lady Bird says that she hates California, does not want to go to college there, even though they just did a full college tour of California, and instead wants to go to school in New York where she can be free, creative, and a writer. But Lady Bird is not just a defiant teenager. Throughout the film, Lady Bird insists on asserting her individuality, is written by A.O. Scott. Marion retorts by explaining that Lady Bird's brother and girlfriend went to Berkeley but are unemployed, her father's company is laying off workers, and that Lady Bird would not even get into Eastern schools. The tension and volume of their voices rise as they argue back and forth for a couple of minutes. This leads to Marion calling Lady Bird by her real name, Christine, and the blunt statement that Lady Bird should go to City College, probably jail, and then back to City College. At the peak of the argument, Lady Bird has had enough. So while they are still barreling down the empty highway, Lady Bird unbuckles her seatbelt, opens the door, and rolls out of the car. Lady Bird accomplishes what Marling put into words about the stories in which women are involved. Lady Bird is the protagonist of the film and is not objectified, disposed of, or made the strong female lead. In fact, she is quite the opposite. She is in control of her own life, 
she has a bittersweet ending, and she has vulnerable moments throughout the film. Although I did not love the film as much as I had expected, it begs the question of why there are not more films like this. Why are there not more films with female protagonists who are incredibly strong, yet layered and not altered by patriarchy? Lady Bird seems to present one solution to the problem that Marling addresses in her essay, but I am certain that there are more ways to create female characters with these layered personalities and traits. Seeing a film like this makes me excited for what the future of filmmaking holds and how storytelling will change. I think Lady Bird is just the start of a whole new wave of films with these incredible characters that have been restricted for so long. Much like the current divide between genders today, the entertainment industry needs not only to reflect the shifting balance, but become a cause of that shift in balance.